In 2018, rapper Kendrick Lamar won the Pulitzer Prize in music for his third album, Damn. The album was celebrated for its innovative use specifically of rhythm and timbre, both in hip-hop communities and in music in general, and for its authentic telling of black experience in America through Kendrick Lamar's perspective. Many people who look forward to the Pulitzer Prize every year found this to be a great announcement and a great moment in history, and others... well... Others got pretty pissy about it. Most of the criticisms of this decision were based purely in ignorance, not understanding hip-hop, its conventions, its innovations, its history. But then there were also arguments about space and about appropriateness, where people would say, oh, well, the Pulitzer is usually for classical musicians and for jazz artists, and classical music is dying, so why is the Pulitzer recognizing this famous hip-hop artist when there are classical musicians that they could be highlighting with this award? Well, here's the problem with that logic. It's one of hypocrisy, because when we talk about space between classical music and other genres, well, classical music has been taking up space and taking away from other genres for centuries to the detriment of those original practitioners. Now, depending upon the perspective that you're coming to this video with, that might be something that's surprising to hear or maybe even upsetting, and you might be wondering what could possibly be damaging about performing any type of music. Well, let me start with a story. When I was a high school percussionist, I went to a lot of band festivals, and whenever the guest conductor would get up to speak to us for the first time, he, and yes, it was always a guy, would get up and tell us something, something like this. Music is the universal language. No matter who you are, and no matter who you're there with, whether you've met these people before, or whether you even speak the same language, you can sit down together and play a piece of music together, and that is beautiful. And... Yeah, there's some nice stuff about that, and I'll admit, when I was younger, I took that comment pretty uncritically. But here's the thing. Music is universal. It's used in every culture across the globe. But music is not a universal language. It's used in very different ways. What people consider music can be very different. And when performing the music of a culture, you need to come to it with a certain understanding, a certain identity, and a certain perspective in order to truly understand it. And that's something that we have a problem with in classical music. Privileged populations within the classical music tradition have a bad habit of wanting to have their cake and eat it too, where we express classical music as being this universal style that transcends all of our personal, societal, and political differences, but then we also tend to be really uncomfortable with the idea of breaking from our historically Eurocentric traditions. Now, in isolation, there's nothing wrong with a musical tradition being tied to a specific culture, but the problem that we face in the classical community is that our tradition is tied to a history of racism and colonialism that created the unjust power structures that we are reckoning with in the modern day. Classical music didn't become a so-called universal tradition because it transcends or even combines several cultural musics. Its breadth of influence is mostly the result of centuries of violence, and many traditions have been co-opted into the classical tradition not through cultural synergy, but through cultural theft. This, in essence, is the problem with cultural appropriation the use of a cultural tradition to which one doesn't belong without the respect, understanding, and support of the community which created it. There are several notable examples of cultural appropriation throughout the history of classical music. For example, much of the success of Mozart can be attributed to his younger years when he was allowed to travel and learn the styles of many different cultures and countries. Richard Wagner, though he was a virulent anti-Semite, profited much off of the creation of Jewish composers and used a lot of conventions of Jewish music in his own work. Debussy, during an era in which the West was rapidly expanding and colonizing into the rest of the world, was noted for using his exotic scales and was considered an innovator at the time. The problem is, cultural appropriation didn't end in some bygone era. It's a problem we're still dealing with today, and classical music is no exception. Just last year, composer and performer Carolyn Shaw and the group Roomful of Teeth came under fire for their use of Inuit throat singing in Shaw's Partita for Eight Voices, a piece which certainly put the group on the map and won Carolyn Shaw the Pulitzer Prize in Music in 2013. What we have in this situation is a group of mostly white performers who are profiting off of the work of musicians of color who are in turn facing the extinction of their own musical cultures. Rounding back to Kendrick Lamar in 2018 and recognizing that there are conflicting accounts, Part of the reason why Damn entered the Pulitzer conversation in the first place was because there was another piece of music already being considered for the prize that was within the realm and strictures of classical music, but that used hip-hop as an influence. Knowing that, and seeing the reaction to Kendrick Lamar's winning the Pulitzer in 2018, and also thinking about this in the context of the reckoning that we're having in 2020 with racial justice in America and across the world, we, especially as white classical musicians, need to be recognizing our privilege and coming to terms with two issues that we have within classical music. 
the issues of legitimacy and legitimizing and that of gatekeeping. We seem to consider classical music as this acultural universal thing that anything else can come to, and we use that as an excuse to use cultural appropriation a lot. As classical musicians, and especially among white classical musicians, we need to break with this habit of thinking of classical music as this all-encompassing, universal, and often argued superior style, when in fact that isn't the case. And if we want this to be a universal practice that allows people from all different walks of life to come in and appreciate this style, then we need to stop letting the ideas of universality and exclusionary practices continue to coexist. Much like the conversations being had about racial justice across the United States right now, the conversation within classical music is going to be a long, slow, and grueling process of enacting change. But if we want to be allies, there are things we can be doing both in the short term and in the long term to make our classical music spaces more racially just. Over the coming weeks and months, I'm going to be interviewing black musicians and other musicians of color to talk about ways that classical musicians from privileged populations can be better allies both in the near term and in the long term, and on individual and systemic levels. I will be editing and releasing these videos in the coming weeks and months as my schedule allows, but in the meantime I would like to take the rest of this video to talk about the first steps that we can take into allyship, especially as white classical musicians, where we're analyzing our circles, analyzing our tastes, and analyzing our practices. So to begin, let's look at our circle of colleagues. A lot of what we do as musicians is gigging. We perform, we teach, and a big part of making that job work in the long term is finding subs and making referrals. And so when you're referring somebody, how often do they belong to the same community of privilege that you do? If you're white, how often are you referring white people versus people of color to that position? If you're a cisgendered man, how often are you referring men versus women or non-binary folks or two-spirit folks? And if you're straight, how often are you referring straight people versus people from the LGBTQ plus community? A big part of making a career viable is making connections, and those referrals can be really important parts of that. And so if people of privilege are referring only other people of privilege to those positions, then we're continuing that cycle of not allowing people from underprivileged populations to make a viable living in this career field, and that's a problem. It's especially important in these moments to avoid tokenism, because it's not enough to just know a colleague from a marginalized community. Just as we do with our colleagues who belong to the same communities of privilege as we do, we need to recognize our colleagues' individual value that they bring to the table, not just their relationship to marginalization. Also take this time to consider your listening and your purchasing habits. If you're listening to a piece of music from the classical tradition, how often is it from the canon of dead white male composers? Looking outside of the canon with both composers and performers, how often does that person belong to a marginalized community, whether that be by race or by gender or by sexual orientation? And then also consider, if any, what is the relevance of that identity that they are bringing to that piece of music? There's a lot to love about the classical music tradition. I love my job, I love the music I perform, I love the people that I perform it with, I love my students, I love writing music. But at the end of the day, we have to acknowledge an unfortunate reality. The, the classical music tradition is steeped in centuries of colonialist and racist history. And if we want the classical music community to be that open and inviting and universal space that we like to say that it is, then we need to start the work of making it a more just and equitable place by undoing these structures that have kept people marginalized for centuries. This is not something that can be done by any individual or by any single act, but this is by internal work and external work being done by all of us for a very, very long time. I am very lucky to have the platform that I have, and I'm really excited to share this work publicly with all of you. I'm very excited for all the interviews with black musicians, with other musicians of color, and with musicians from other marginalized community from across our career field in the coming weeks and months. I would like to thank my patrons over at Patreon for funding these interviews, and I would like to thank all of you for watching. Have a good day.